Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Binko Gambit speedrun series here. In this particular episode, we are going to be playing against players in the rating range of 900 to 1000. And what you'll be seeing a lot of in this particular episode in the three games that I play, we're going to be seeing situations where I'm playing against the London system, uh, sort of similar-ish versions of a Jobava London type of setup, uh, players who put their knight on c3 early in the game, players who put their bishop on f4 early in, uh, early in the game, we're going to be seeing how to play against these types of setups. You're going to see how to react to them, going for the move d5 in the center of the board in order to stop our opponent from putting a pawn on e4, playing the move c5 to attack their pawn on d4, what happens if they take our c5 pawn, uh, c5 pawn? what happens if they play other uh, in a different way. So those are going to be some of the things we'll be seeing in this particular episode. And so let's get right into the games and check them out. All right, so we're in our first game for this particular episode. Our opponent starts off with d4, so we're going for knight f6, looking to play into a bingo gambit if they allow that. In this particular game, they decide to go for bishop f4, which is uh, signaling that they're going for the London system, most likely. And this is a very common opening. You're going to see this a lot of the times uh, at really every late rating level. I believe we've had at least one London system game so far in this uh, speedrun series. Um, so against bishop f4, I do recommend the move pawn to c5. I like the idea of kind of immediately attacking the opponent's center and putting pressure on their position sooner rather than later. This also fits in pretty nicely with our kind of general bingo gambit approach, where we're usually playing pawn to c5 against almost every second move that white can play anyways. So they go for the move e3, which is pretty uh, consistent with the London system. Usually if somebody's playing the London system, they'll go for e3, c3, develop the knight to f3, knight to d2, bishop to d3, bishop on f4. And this is usually the setup they're going for, uh, usually on some sort of autopilot a lot of the times. Um, now against this setup, what I like to do, uh, I think, again, we saw this in one of the earlier uh, episodes, I really like putting the queen on b6 very early in the opening, trying to attack our opponent's b2 pawn, because the bishop is no longer on the c1 square protecting that pawn. So this is the move I recommend here, immediately causing uh, a bit of a threat of taking the pawn on b2 if white's not careful. We're not always going to take this pawn when it's available, but we are at least making it so that white has to be a bit careful about the idea of this pawn being taken. For example, if somebody just kind of autopilots here and plays a move like c3, we will then take the pawn in that kind of position. And uh, as soon as I say it, I kind of speak it into existence, you could say. Um, so pawn to c3 is not safe in this situation because they did not address our threat of attacking the b2 pawn. They might have thought we were trying to attack the d4 pawn, and c3 does defend d4, but, but the pawn on b2 was, was the target. And so I am going to go ahead and take this pawn on b2. I'm also attacking the rook in the corner. So the only safe move for white is to play the move knight to d2 so that their rook is protected by the queen. And once they play knight to d2, I very well may just grab another pawn on the c3 square uh, since that is no longer protected. Um, it is possible if I take on c3 for white to play the move rook to c1, lining up towards my queen and my c5 pawn. And once I move the queen away, they might take the pawn. And then I have to be a little bit careful about some of the activity that they get in that position. But keep in mind, I have one pawn. I've actually taken two pawns. They got one of them back. So I'm still going to be up one pawn. Um, and my position is pretty rock solid. I have really no weaknesses to speak of in a case like that. So I think that's what I'm going to go for. I'm trying to figure out if there's any other alternative that's good other than taking this pawn. Knight to d5 is an example of a move that's kind of interesting. It hits the bishop as well as the c3 pawn. Maybe we can take the c3 pawn under a bit more of a uh, like favorable circumstance, you could say. But the fact that I've moved the knight once and that I have to move the knight twice, I've moved the queen twice. We're kind of walking a little bit of tightrope territory, I will say here, where we're up a pawn, but the opponent is going to be able to develop their pieces pretty quickly. I, I do think, though, that we can get away with it. So I'm going to take the pawn. White's best move, I assume, is rook c1 followed by taking the pawn on c5. If they don't do that, I might even have knight to e4 going after the knight on b2 that's pinned. And I might also be having the idea of taking on d4 at the right time. I do have to be careful here about the rook lining up towards my queen and my bishop. So I might not actually want to take the pawn on d4 because then rook to c8 would 
or sorry, rook to c1 would uh, skewer my queen to my bishop, which would be very bad. So maybe knight to c6 and then taking the pawn is an idea, or once again, knight to e4 to go after the pin keys is, uh, is an idea. I do think, though, that white's best move is probably to move the rook to c1. I think I would go back to a5. They would take on c5. I might go... Oh, actually, sorry. I can't go all the way back to d... Uh, I can't go all the way back to d8. That was actually my intention because he has this move bishop c7 when the rook is on c5 that would trap my queen. So I actually have to be a bit more careful here than I thought at first. So yeah, I think rook queen a5 would actually be a huge mistake um, because after the rook takes, the only way to guard the bishop and the queen is to go back to d8, but then bishop c7 does trap the queen there. So... I think that being said, I'm going to go queen a3 instead. That way, if they take the pawn on c5, then my queen's not being attacked. That's that's kind of my uh, my point there, you could say. Um, so let's move over here. If they take with the rook, then I'll probably play knight to c6 and develop at that point. Uh, that's, that's my idea. If they take with the pawn, then... I might still develop the knight to c6 anyways. I do need to catch up on development pretty quickly here uh, so that I don't fall too far behind and get myself into trouble. I am up two pawns at the moment, and even if they do take the c5 pawn, I'll still be up one pawn. So, you know, you could kind of say in return for my... Uh, for the In return for the pressure that white is kind of putting on me in the short term, I do have this long-term asset of an extra pawn. The longer the game goes on, the more, you know, if I can kind of wiggle out of a little bit of the short-term danger, then uh, then the extra pawn is going to be a, a big asset. Okay, so I'm going to prioritize developing. I don't want them, of course, to take the bishop, so I will play the move knight to c6. And the rook on c5 is definitely a bit of a liability that white has to be careful about. I have ideas of pawn to d6 or pawn to e6 opening up the bishop. Uh, pawn to e5 is actually a, a threat as well where I would attack the bishop on f4, as well as opening up the attack on the rook on c5 at the same time. That's also something white has to be careful about. And I'm not really too concerned about white attacking my queen on a3 here. If they go knight c4 or knight to b1, I have a check on b4 available, which will kind of buy me a little bit of time to, uh, to get my queen back to a safer location and stuff like that. Uh, they also cannot push the pawn up to d5, to attack my knight because the pawn is needed on the d4 square to protect the rook. Okay, so they play the move bishop c4. Um, I think I can go for this e5 idea. This is what I am leaning towards here. Um, but pawn to e6 also looks very solid and good at the same time. The big issue white has now is that the rook on c5 is actually very close to being trapped in this position. I think that e5 is best because it makes two threats simultaneously. The rook is hit uh, as well as the bishop on uh, f4 being hit. There are maybe some ways for white to like take the e5 pawn and sacrifice some material in a way that could be a little bit tricky or dangerous that I have to be careful about. Um, but I think I will be able to survive there. So I think I am going to go for pawn to e5. There's still not any great or fantastic ways for white to stir up too much trouble here. Again, if my queen is attacked, queen to b4 check is pretty good. And in the meantime, I'm attacking, again, the rook on c5, the bishop on f4. Um, and I don't see a great way for white to solve both of these problems simultaneously here. Maybe their best move is to play rook takes pawn with check. I take with the knight. They take back with their pawn attacking my knight. That could get a little bit tricky. Uh, I think I have a good answer for that, but we'll cross that bridge if it uh, if if they end up doing that. I think if they go that route, I might have the move pawn to d5 counterattacking the bishop on c4. But we are walking a little bit of a tightrope there. It could become a little bit complicated. Um, but all that being said, we are ahead material. So if we can kind of walk the tightrope and survive, in the short term, the long term is much better for us, for sure. Okay, white tries this move knight to b1, but as I mentioned earlier, I'm not too concerned about the queen being hit, because I can always play this move queen to b4 check, counterattacking the king, and now, regardless of how they deal with the check, I will be able to take one of these two pieces next move, and white's going to be in 
gigantic trouble in this position. They're already down a pawn, but they're also about to be down maybe a rook, maybe a bishop. Uh, if the queen blocks, we might even take the knight on b1 with check first, which looks very bad for white. Uh, yeah, lots and lots of problems for them. They're not going to be able to save everything simultaneously here. It's just not possible. Okay, they put the knight back on d2. Here, I think I'm going to eliminate the rook. Taking the bishop is also an option, but then they could move the rook and hit the queen. So I think I'm going to eliminate the rook here at this point. And I'm also still attacking the bishop. So if they take my bishop, I get theirs. I'm going to be up a ton of material. And we can also castle pretty quickly. And white's in a, uh, just in a completely lost position because they're going to be down a full rook pretty quickly. Okay, they take the pawn on e5, but they're still down a rook. So that doesn't really, you know, fix a whole lot. It does save the bishop on f4, but now my bishop on c5 isn't hit. Now I'm going to go for the move knight to e4. I believe this will be my idea. And I'm taking advantage of the knight on d2 being pinned. I would love to play a move like queen takes d2 check, trade the queens. Once the queens are off the board, there's zero issues to be concerned about whatsoever. They play the move knight f3. I'm going to go ahead and I think I'll take the knight just to begin with here. They recapture. Now I can't take the bishop because that's protected. I also can't take the pawn because that's protected. But I think I've done enough damage at this point. I am up an entire rook. I think now I'm just going to castle to get my king safe. And yeah, we're going to castle, get the king to safety, and we're in good shape here. Okay, white castles as well. Their knight on d2 is still frozen because they need to keep the bishop protected. Uh, I think what I'm going to do here, I don't want to play rook e8. There could be some ideas of white attacking the f7 pawn once I move the rook away from protecting it. I think what I'm going to do is go for the move pawn to d6. And I'm going to look to develop my light square bishop. And even though we're up an entire rook, it's very important to still prioritize development. Because if we never put these pieces to use, then what's the good of having them? <laughs> if I never move the bishop on c8 or the rook on a8, I'm actually maybe even down material if I never get those uh, pieces in the game. Okay, uh, white took the pawn. Uh, I think I'm just going to recapture with my bishop. Just double checking there's no problems with that. Um, there is this move a3 that's slightly annoying. Um, okay. With that being the case, I don't think the pawn on d6 is really going anywhere anytime soon. I think I am just going to play this move bishop to e6, and I'm just going to offer a trade of pieces. I can take the pawn back on d6 anytime. I just want to get more pieces off the board, because the less pieces on the board, the less uh, danger I have to be a little bit careful about. So if the bishops disappear, that's one less piece that can attack me. And that's also one kind of less piece that's on the board so that we're closer to the end game where the extra rook is going to make a big difference. The way that I think about extra material and trying to convert those types of situations uh, in the positions where you have that extra material, uh, I think of it kind of like a um, if you're playing, let's say, basketball. I don't know how many of the viewers are uh, basketball fans. But if you're playing basketball, uh, if you have five players on your team and the opponent has the other team has four players, if those four players are good enough, they can beat your five players. You know, if they have like LeBron James on their team, uh, they're they're gonna they're gonna win against you know five uh, random guys off the street, so to speak. Um, however, if you take one player off each team, it goes from five versus four to four versus three, three versus two, two versus one. Eventually, you get to a scenario where it's one versus zero. And you pretty much can't, you can't lose if you have the only guy on the court and there's nobody defending. You just go put the ball in the basket uh, consistently every every time you have the chance. So uh, it's the same way in chess. If there's if you're up a rook, but there's still a bunch of pieces on the board. If you know you could make a mistake and the opponent could create some trouble and they could still you know they could still win. Um, but if you have the only piece left on the board and you have a rook and they have no no pieces, maybe they only have pawns. It's very, very unlikely you're going to lose that. Okay, white pushed the pawn to d7. Um, I'm going to go rook to d8 to line up towards this pawn. Um, yeah, I think we'll just go for this. The goal is to take the pawn next move. I could also consider moves like rook takes f4, where I'm giving up a little bit of material to get things off the board. 
even if I take on f4, uh, they take back, I capture once again, I would still be up uh, a whole minor piece at that point. I wouldn't be up a rook, but I would be up a minor piece, which is still quite good. Here, white plays knight e4. This is not safe. The queen does protect this square, so we take the piece for free. And yeah, now we're up a rook and a knight. Uh, the only way we lose this game, I think, at this point is if we allow this pawn to promote. And so we're going to heavily emphasize preventing this pawn from promoting. Uh, we're going to try to eliminate it as quickly as possible. So they do attack my rook on d8. I'm going to play the move bishop to e7 to block off that diagonal and also offer a trade of bishops. And then pretty soon I'll play a move like queen to d5 and try to get rid of the, d, uh, the d7 pawn. If they take my bishop, I take back. And yeah, the d7 pawns can be very hard for white to hold on to in the long run. Uh, okay, they're attacking my queen first. I'm going to still play that queen to d5 move. This is also protected. If they trade the queens, the pawn on d7 is doomed. Even if they don't trade the queens, I'll still take the pawn on d7, you know, in the near future anyways. So let's see what white does. Okay, they take my bishop first. I get, am most likely just going to trade the queens first. Uh, taking with the knight first also looks absolutely fine. Um, maybe taking with the knight's even better, because if I trade the queens and then take back, they do at least keep the pawn on d7 alive. So I think I'll actually take back with the knight, and then next we're going to just eliminate the d7 pawn. Uh, I don't want the rook to get to d1 for free, where it kind of holds on to the d7 pawn and keeps it alive. As I said a moment ago, getting rid of this, uh, getting rid of this, um, this pawn on d7 is the priority. I could take with the knight, maybe I would get kicked by the pawn, I'm just going to take with the pawn. And again, nothing white can do here to stop me from taking the pawn on d7 and protecting the, uh, the b7 pawn. Now we're just going to get on the open file. We're going to get down to the second rank, which is usually a good location for a rook to be on. You attack pawns, but you also kind of cut the king off and keep the king locked on the back rank here. Next, then we'll go rook c7 and then try to trade the, trade the rooks. He pushes the pawn. Now I don't want to take this pawn and lose my rook. I'll just push the pawn forward instead, push it up the board, try to get rid of the rook, try to promote the pawn, and that's uh, that's the game plan here. Not a whole lot white can really do to stop this, though I do have to keep the speed up because I only have 45 seconds on the clock. So he's attacking my rook. Let's move the rook away and not lose our rook for free. We'll push the pawn, go to c1, get the, uh, get the rooks off the board, and be in very good shape. Might also just take the pawn on e6 and try to get the other rook to the uh, to the second rank as well. Okay, they go king f1. Um, okay, we're going to go pawn to d2. Try to go rook to c1. I don't really care so much here if white eliminates the pawn. I really just want to get the rooks off the board. I mean, there were a ton of different ways I could have played this position, but I think this one's going to be simple enough. I just want to get the rooks off the board. No counterplay for the opponent. Just like I described with the basketball uh, analogy, get the opponent's pieces off the board, have my pieces be the only ones that are left, and then it makes it very easy to win there because the counterplay from the opponent is non-existent uh, at that point. Okay, if they take the rook, that's even better for me because I also now get a queen. They should have taken the pawn instead. Uh, here I'm going to give a check. I'm not even concerned about this pawn now. I'm just going to start giving checks. I could have also checked on e1. We're just going to try to deliver mate. Uh, let's go rook d4, attacking the pawn. Tons of ways to win. Take this with check. Move this rook to d2. And then queen to f2 will be the checkmate. Okay, so we get the mate here. Let's go back through the game uh, and analyze some of the key moments. So... Our opponent goes for this London system with d4, knight f6, bishop f4. We hit the pawn with c5. e3 is by far the most common move you'll face in this kind of position if you uh, are playing this opening repertoire yourself. I like this queen to b6 move uh, going after the b2 pawn. And white's best move in this position uh, is either to play knight to c3 or knight to a3. These are the moves that I think are the best options for them. Both of those moves are not very obvious to play, I would say, if you're not familiar with kind of the opening theory or knowledge there, because it looks like against both of those moves, you're just losing the pawn on b2. Um, 
However, there are some tricks. If white goes knight c3 and you take the pawn right away, now you have to start being careful about this fork on c7. And even if you stop that, white can, you know, hit your queen, hit your queen. You could actually just walk right into a perpetual attack and actually just draw the game here. Um, which is, you know, if you're wanting to draw, I guess it's fine, but that's, that's not really my recommendation. Uh, if white goes knight c3, I actually don't recommend taking the pawn. I actually like the move pawn to d6 instead. And then usually we'll go with g6, bishop g7, castle, uh, take the pawn on d4. And it's a solid position for both players, but I do think it takes a lot of London system players out of their kind of comfort zone. Because first of all, a lot of them are used to the pawn being on c3 instead of the knight being on c3. And um, now that the knight's on c3, they are a little less comfortable you know they're used to the knight being on d2 and the pawn on c3 and things are already a bit different they're not able to autopilot the opening like they might be used to uh, doing and so i think this kind of position is totally good for black against knight to a3 I, I would do the same thing actually i would not take the pawn because they have the same idea uh, i would do the same d6 g6 bishop g7 and okay they could put the pawn on c3 but the knight on a3 is actually just kind of oddly placed. Um, I will also point out here uh, a little bit of a, of a little bit of you know uh, interesting information for anybody who's you know uh, listening to the analysis on this particular game. I believe it was a game that was played in the U.S. Championship this past year. Uh, white was uh, Andrew Tang, who is a very strong grandmaster. And black was Sam Shanklin, uh, also a very strong grandmaster, of course. Um, and I have uh, done some work with Sam. Uh, we've he, he's taught me in the past with some with uh, with some coaching lessons. We've also worked together. He's done some stuff for me, uh, helping me out with chessable. Um, he actually had a game in the U.S. Championship against Andrew Tang, where Andrew played knight to a three. Sam played d6. He was playing the opening repertoire that I recommended. Uh, he said he liked the lines I recommended against the London system. And then Andrew played this move c3, which is actually a very big mistake. And Sam could have won the game in a handful of moves. If he takes the pawn on b2 now, and then the knight goes to b5, this move knight to e4 now because the pawn's on c3 is actually, uh, this is actually a very big problem for white. White actually is pretty much lost, in, you know, especially at the Grandmaster level, I would say that white's lost at this point, because even if white can give the check on c7, black is going to be threatening the checkmate on f2. So uh, just kind of going to show you that, you know, regardless of the rating range or level that you're playing this repertoire at, uh, whether you're in this kind of 900 range or if you're significantly higher, it, it's still very good, solid uh, um, recommendations against all these different openings. And, uh, you, you, you know, Sam was even nice enough, uh, or I don't even want to say nice enough. He, he thought the opening, uh, variations were good enough to play at the U S championship level. So I, I was very happy to see, um, uh, see him play that in the U S championship, which was cool. Anyways, though, in this game, our opponent played C3. This does not defend the pawn on B2, but it also doesn't activate the knight at the same time. So we do take the pawn. We take another pawn. Uh, I did not want to go to a five, which would actually be a huge blunder. Uh, forking the queen and the bishop. Here we would lose the queen. This is very bad. Don't do this. So queen a3 was better. Uh, then knight c6. And I think white just ran into big trouble after this pawn to e5 move. Um, there's just really not a fantastic way to save all of their pieces simultaneously. They ended up trying to attack the queen. We checked. We took the rook. We were up an entire uh, rook and mostly just focused on trading pieces, eliminating the free stuff, trading more stuff, and, you know, we were up a rook and a knight. We won the game without too much trouble uh, from there. Okay, so that's it for this game. Let's go ahead and get into our next one. So we've got our next game here against d4. We are going for knight f6. And our opponent goes for the move knight to c3. So uh, this move tends to signal the start of the Jobava London system. Uh, I do believe that we had, I believe we had one game of this in one of the earlier episodes, but I don't think our opponent played bishop f4 after we played uh, our response. So against the move knight c3, uh, white has the potential for playing the move pawn to e4. And so against the move knight c3 on the second move of the game, the move I recommend here is to play the move pawn to d5. 
We don't want to stick with our normal Binko Gambit type of C5 move in this situation, because after White plays the move Pawn to D5, they're going to be able to play Pawn to E4 without too much fight. And we aren't really able to play the, uh, the B5 Gambit, because there's no Pawn on C4 to capture the B5 Pawn. We would simply be losing the Pawn to the Knight without pulling away one of White's central Pawns from the center. So with that in mind, I'm going to go for the move D5 instead of the move C5. Uh, white could go for bishop f4. That's most likely the, the most common move. This particular opponent goes for the move pawn to e3 instead. And uh, the drawback to this setup that white has is that the bishop on c1 is blunted by this pawn on e3. Generally speaking, it's better for white to play the move bishop f4, uh, bishop f4 first, then pawn to e3. That way, the bishop isn't blocked in. Uh, when they go for pawn to e3, though, now the bishop is blunted and... Uh, Generally speaking, we're pretty happy about seeing this if we're in black shoes. So what I'm going to go for here, now that I've already, now that I've already played d5, uh, I am actually going to go for the c5 move. And I think, again, I did mention this in one of the previous uh, episodes. I think we had a very similar position in one of the other games. Um, and the idea of c5, not only when we're doing it with kind of our Binko Gambit approach, but when we're even when we're doing it here when our pawn's are already on the d5 square ourselves, part of the idea of c5 is I'm looking to attack or chip away at the opponent's central d4 pawn. Uh, not necessarily with the intention of taking it, um, but more so with the intention of uh, almost, I'd say, like luring white's pawn away from the d4 square. So, for example, if white had taken our pawn on c5, we would be able to play the move e6, most likely regain the pawn with our bishop, and then white would have only one central pawn compared to our two central pawns. In this particular case, white decides to play the move a3 instead, and we do have to be a little bit careful. They may try to capture our pawn and then reinforce it with a move like pawn to b4. Um, that being said, I'm not necessarily in a rush to trade pawns because then that allows white to reopen their bishop on the c1 square. At the same time, I don't want to let white take my pawn for free. So the question is, how do I want to protect the pawn on c5? Uh, I could do pawn to e6, which is kind of the move I'm leaning towards for the moment. Uh, knight to d7 looks a little bit odd because it blocks in the bishop on c8, but it is technically an option that's available as well. Um, I think I'm going to go for the e6 route. I do understand that this is somewhat similar to White's e3 move, so we actually both have our queenside bishops blocked in. But I have an easier time putting pressure on White's center because I've already put my pawn up on the c5 square. White has a much more difficult time attacking our center uh, because their pawn on c4, uh, their c2 pawn that could go up to c4 one day is blocked by the knight that's on the c3 square. So that's generally not a great scenario for White from a strategic or positional standpoint. Uh, and they end up capturing the pawn on c5 anyways. So now we get to recapture with our bishop. We now have two pawns in the center compared to our opponent's one pawn in the center. Um, and when I say the center, I'm talking more about the, the, the d and the e files in this kind of situation. And, uh, and we also have pretty normal looking development, I would say. So here white plays queen d3. Uh, they might be thinking about checking on b5. Uh, not entirely sure. Even if they were to check on b5, we can play the move knight to d7 to block the check and to protect the bishop at the same time. So it's not really a threat I'm all that concerned about. Uh, and that being said, at the same time, I actually don't need to really do anything all that drastic to deal with it. Uh, I can either go for knight to c6 right away, or I can just castle the king to avoid the check. I think I'm just going to go ahead and castle the king. It seems simple enough to go for that option. Um, and now queen to b5 is not a check, so I'm not really too concerned about the queen moving over there. It might be smart for white to try a move like pawn, oops, sorry, uh, like a move like pawn to e4 in the near future, uh, probably after they develop a few more pieces first, um, because they do need to try to attack my center at some point in the game. Uh, they decide, though, to move the knight to the edge of the board and attack my bishop. The drawback to this move is that we do have the option in this position of playing a move like queen to a5, checking the king on e1, as well as attacking the knight on a4. It isn't guaranteed to win material necessarily, because white could bring the knight back to c3 to block the check. 
Um, but at the same time, if white's best move is to bring the knight back to c3, then it kind of might be a case where, you know, the knight going to the edge of the board wasn't that useful in the first place. Um, with that in mind, one move I would have to be a little bit careful about is maybe they could block with the pawn on b4. And if I end up capturing their knight, they take my uh, bishop on c5. And that might be a possible option for our opponent, but I wouldn't really be too concerned about that. I'm most likely going to be able to win the pawn back on c5 at some point. Um, so is there anything else that we can do? I'm leaning towards this queen a5 move. I think if we push the knight back to c3, then we kind of get a free move to do whatever we want to do in the position. Um, that being said, I think a move like bishop to d6 or bishop to e7, these also look like absolutely solid and good moves as well. So I'm going to go for the queen a5 check. I'm honestly not 100% sure if this is the best move in the position or not. But I'm going to hit the king, hit the knight. The knight does end up going back. Uh, now, I'm not concerned about pawn to b4 forking my pieces just yet in this version of things because I can take the pawn on b4 and the a pawn can't capture back without losing the rook in the corner. So I'm going to prioritize development. Let's go ahead and play the move knight to c6. Develop a new piece. If white goes b4, I'll either take with the knight or take with the bishop. And otherwise, okay, they play the move rook to b1. So this is a smart idea. Maybe it's not the most principled idea. White is still develop, uh, delaying their development on with their minor pieces quite heavily. But they are threatening pawn to b4 now that the rook has moved away from the a file. So I do need to react to this in some way. Um, the question is, do I retreat the bishop, retreat the queen, or kind of do something different? I think I'm going to... Let's see here. I'm actually not 100% sure. I think I'm just going to retreat the bishop given the circumstance, quite honestly. Let's just move the bishop back to safety. And if white plays b4, we'll move the queen back to safety. And it might feel like we've wasted time moving the queen out and then back and the bishop out and back. But it is also the case when white starts pushing their b pawn, they're going to leave little weaknesses in its wake. Uh, whenever you push pawns, you always give up control of certain squares in return for controlling new squares. So if white does make a move like pawn to b4, then the a3 pawn's a little bit weaker, the knight would be a little bit less protected. There'd be little slight issues that white would have to be uh, careful about in the long run. Okay, so the knight goes, uh, the bishop goes to d2. Um, I'm not too concerned about this knight moving away anywhere because it doesn't really have any fantastic places it can move to that I would be overly bothered by. So with that in mind, I think I might just play the move pawn to e5, just trying to uh, gain more space in the center and then I can develop my bishop after that. Uh, if I wanted to play it really safe, I could retreat the queen first, but I don't think there's any knight moves that are overly bothersome. So I'm going to push the pawn. If the knight takes the pawn on d5, I can take that with my queen. If the knight moves somewhere else, I can move the queen at that point. And, uh, so, and if they play pawn to b4, now I can actually maybe take the pawn on a3. Uh, might be a possibility at that point. If, if they don't do anything to threaten me here, then I'm probably going to play bishop to e6, ac activate the rooks, put them in the center of the board, and we're going to be in good shape in a position like that. Okay, they do move the knight in a different way. They attack my queen. I'm going to retreat the queen. Uh, let's just go back to the starting square, quite honestly. Again, it might feel like queen d8 to a5 and back to d8, and the bishop came to c5 and went backwards. But in the meantime, I've gotten more space in the center of the board. I'm castled. My opponent's not. I can attack the knight with pawn to a6 pretty quickly. A move like pawn to h3 doesn't really do anything to bother me here, I would say. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I could kick the knight. I don't know if I need to rush to do that, quite honestly. I think I'm just going to develop the bishop. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to activate all the pieces. Rook to c8. Probably hit the knight at some point. Move the queen back out. Activate the other rook. And really just try to centralize all my pieces. And it's a bit awkward for white to develop their kingside pieces. Because, for example, if they develop the knight, they're already walking into this pawn fork in the center. If they develop the bishop, they still need to develop the knight. And if they develop the knight to e2, then they're blocking the bishop in. So there's all these different kind of problems that white's going to have to worry about. 
Okay, so they play move G4. Uh, I'm going to start to play aggressively at this point, I would say. So uh, my center's protected and, and secured. My pieces, my minor pieces are all developed. Uh, I'm castled. Everything in this position is giving me a green light to try to start attacking my opponent and making threats and forcing moves and kicking them around here. So I'm going to start with the move A6. Let's first attack the knight. We're going to kick it backwards. Once it retreats, then we're going to play the move D4 to attack again. And the goal is to open up the middle of the board where White's King is going to be a target for a potential check down the road. So D4 is the next move. Attacking the knight. I'm also opening up this square on D5 where I might be able to go attack the opponent's rook that's in the corner. And this attack on the rook is only possible because White just played this very, very risky move pawn to, uh, pawn to G4. Uh, in hindsight, it would have also been possible to push the E-pawn first, kick the queen, and then push the D-pawn. That, that would have also been a pretty good way of doing things. But I think this also looks quite strong. So white ends up retreating the knight. Uh, let's go for... The queen is almost running low on squares. I'm going to go for the move bishop to D5 to attack the rook here. I think white has to play rook h2. They could block with the pawn, but then I'm probably going to play the move pawn to e4 and really just try to rip open the center of the board ASAP. If they go rook to h2, then I might go bishop to e4. Maybe I'll hit the c2 pawn behind the queen. Pawn to e4 also looks very good. Uh, I think white's in you know, a very difficult spot. It's hard for them to really defend everything that they've got in this kind of position. If they push the e4, uh, the pawn to e4, I'll just take that. If they block with the bishop, I'll take that. So they really have to, you know, move the rook or block with the pawn. They end up moving the rook. I'm going to go for the move e4 now to attack the queen, just continuing to make threats with every single move. The queen has only one safe square, which is to go back to the e2 square. And then I'll go for the move bishop d6 to attack the rook. And again, every move I'm just going to make a threat. I'm going to attack the queen, attack the rook, I first attack the knight, and white's pieces are just being driven backwards. And not really a whole lot that they can do about all of this, to be quite honest with you. Like, now the rook has two different squares it can move to. And then, regardless of which one it moves to, I will probably play the move pawn to d3, attacking the queen. And then once they take, I'll take back, and my bishop will open up towards whichever square the rook goes to. So instead, white decides to play the move pawn to f4. Here I can capture the pawn on passant. I think I've heard somewhere that uh, if on passant's available, you always have to go for it, which is uh, a bit of a joke, but uh, it is a bit of a chess meme, you could say. And white ends up resigning in this position. Uh, if they move the queen away, we would take the rook. If they take here with the knight, I would have probably taken the knight and then taken the rook afterwards. White is losing a ton of material, and it's a very, very bad position for them here. Okay, so let's go back through the game. We will talk about the opening. Uh, so they go d4, knight f6, knight c3. I go for d5. Once again, you don't want to autopilot with a move like c5 here because white now plays d5. And if you go for the binko gambit type of approach here, white just, white's just going to take the pawn. They're still going to maintain their C pawn. And the whole point of the B5 move in the Binko Gambit usually is that you're usually you're trying to pull the opponent's C4 pawn away from protecting the D5 pawn. In this case, we didn't do that. They just took the B pawn and they still have the C pawn. So B5 wouldn't make any sense there. And if you try to play a move like E6 here to attack the center, white protects it, you take. And now you already have to worry about stuff like pawn to E5 attacking the knight. The knight moves. Now they play like knight takes pawn in the center. It's not a very good looking position for black. We're just really behind on development and very far behind on space in the center. I'd really rather not have this position. So uh, we go for the move d5 when our opponent is trying to go for the move e4. And the most common move for white in this position, I believe, is going to be the move bishop f4. This is what's known as the Jobalba London variation. It's kind of like the London that we've seen in some of the other games. But the main difference is the knight's on c3 and blocking the pawn on c2. That's that's really the difference. Um, and so with that being the case, it's a little bit different from a normal London system. I would still recommend playing the move c5 here to attack the center if white guards the center. Here I do actually recommend trading the pawns, developing the bishop to hit the queen, 
And black has a perfectly fine position in a case like this. Maybe we'll see this in one of the future games in the in the speedrun series. But white decided to go for the move pawn to e3 instead. We do still play the move c5 to hit the center. We defend the pawn. They took it. We take back. And the main advantage we now have is a bit more space in the middle of the board. We have a pawn on d5. They have no pawn on d4. So we have a little bit more space. And so that all being said, if white played the rest of the opening and, you know, in a, in a more principled way, you could say, then it wouldn't really be all that much of an advantage for black. I do think black is a little bit better, but if white had done kind of, let's say, more principled moves, like let's say they went knight f3, and then bishop to e2, and then they castle, maybe I would play pawn to e5. Black is still a little bit better because of the space advantage, but white is solid at the same time uh, in a case like this. In the game, though, they made some odd moves. They played queen to d3, which I didn't really... Uh, I don't think this is all that great of a move. We castle. And then knight to a4, putting the knight on the edge of the board. We check and make the knight move back. We develop a new piece. Rook b1 does have the b4 idea. But notice the big issue with white's pieces, or white's opening play, is that they're really just not developing anything new. Uh, no, new no new minor pieces, at least. And they're not getting closer to castling. So even though we're kind of right below the 1000 rating level, I would still say in some regards that following basic opening principles is going to be very good in this rating level. Like even if you don't follow a full-blown repertoire uh, or, uh, you know, even if you're not playing the Binko Gambit, for instance, and you're playing just you know, a solid different opening, as long as you're following opening principles, you're probably going to be doing better than, you know, the large majority of players at this rating level. So I retreat the Bishop to avoid the fork. I gain more space in the center. They move the knight another time. Uh, they're going to have to move the knight eventually another time. And then I start to attack my opponent because I have all of my pieces in the game, uh, all of the minor pieces at least. I'm castled. I have more space. I've done really nothing wrong in the opening, you could say. And it's white who's made a bunch of moves that aren't very good. You know, g4, h3, a3, this knight's moved around a couple of times, the rook has moved, the bishop's gone to d2, the queen's gone to d3. No development of the king side, not any closer to castling, and so now it's time to attack. We go d4 and hit the knight, bishop here hits the rook, this hits the queen, this hits the rook. I capture on passant, white resigns because now they cannot save both the rook and the queen, and white is going to lose material in this position here. So that's it for this game. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this one. Let's go ahead and get into our next one here. All right, so we've got our third game here. Against d4, we're of course going for knight f6. Our opponent is rated just a little over 1,000. So even though this is going to be in the 900 to 1,000 episode, this is pretty, pretty close, I would say. So this is going to qualify. Uh, our opponent goes for bishop f4, signaling the start of the London system. We're going for the move c5. I think we saw this in one of the earlier games in this episode. And this particular opponent decides to take the pawn. So uh, earlier on, I believe we had seen the move e3, and we were going for the move queen to b6. If our, uh, excuse me, if our opponent captures the pawn, uh, here I recommend just going for the move e6 and looking to regain the pawn with the bishop pretty soon. There are some ways that white can hold on to this pawn for a little bit longer. Uh, they could try bishop d6, for example, or there's b4 and stuff like that. Generally speaking, those moves don't really hold on to the pawn uh, sufficiently for very long. Um, so in this particular case, they decide to let us take the pawn back. We are going to uh, grab the pawn. And white decides to advance the knight up to the b5 square. Uh, so this wasn't really a Jobava London system, though it kind of does resemble it a little bit when the opponent has the bishop on f4 and the knight on c3. I did talk a little bit about the Jabal of London in the previous uh, game that we just looked at. Um, and one of the common ideas in the Jabal of London system is for white to do this knight to b5 jump, hoping to get the fork on the c7 square. Uh, the downside, though, of this type of jump is that it usually will not work uh, or usually it is too early to make this knight b5 move when the knight is not protected on the b5 square. If white had already played a move like pawn to e3, then they played knight to b5, it would be a little bit of a different story. But because the knight is not protected on the b5 square right now, we actually have a very easy way to take advantage of this. Uh, so 
we're going to go for the move queen to a5 check. We, we saw a queen a5 type of move in the earlier game uh, where our opponent had the knight on the a4 square instead. This time the knight's on b5, but it's the same kind of fork. We're still attacking, uh, or we were attacking both the king and the knight that was on b5. White does retreat the knight and keep it safe. The problem, though, is that the damage has kind of already been done, and we essentially got in the move queen a5 for free. You could kind of imagine, you know, we had this position, and then we made this move, and we get to make another move. That's pretty much what we have right here. The queen's on a5, and we get to make another move. So it's almost like we get two moves for free, because this knight going to b5 and back to c3 was, uh, was a big waste of time for white. Now, in order to take advantage of this, we are going to be able to uh, go after the knight on c3 that is pinned. And also there's this pawn on f2 that is attacked once by our bishop and defended once by the king. Uh, here I think we can go for the move knight to e4. And we are attacking both of these things uh, essentially you know, simultaneously in this position here. We're actually threatening checkmate in one move. Bishop takes f2 would be an immediate checkmate. And we're also threatening to take on c3. Very difficult for white to deal with both of those. And I think they're just going to lose some form of material here uh, pretty quickly. So, it, I, I, quite honestly, I'm not even really sure what white's best move is. I mean, the mate threat is obviously the more important of the, uh, of the threats. If they play a move like pawn to e3, though, we're going to play knight takes c3. They could try queen to d2 trying to pin our knight, but we have the move bishop to b4 to break the pin and line up towards the queen and the king, and white would be in big trouble there. Uh, quite honestly, I really just think white's in big trouble anyways, because there's really not a good way to deal with this. Um, maybe white could try bishop e3, and then if we trade the bishops and then take, then they can play queen to d2. Maybe that works. But their position is still going to be pretty atrocious with the doubled e pawns, maybe doubled c pawns. Uh, their their position's going to be a, a big train wreck. Uh, and a big part of this is really the fact that they just try this knight b5 move. It's not safe to go for. They had to move the knight back. And we essentially got two moves for free in the opening. And if you get two moves for free in the opening and you're able to make strong threats with those moves, it can really be an entire game changer. So if they had played, let's say, like e3 or knight f3, those would have been, you know, generally solid moves. And we wouldn't have been able to, you know, cause a huge amount of trouble for our opponent at that point. Um, but yeah, this knight to b5 jump, we punish that, we continue attacking. It looks like the opponent's disconnected and, uh, and is abandoning the game. So I, I think it's a very, very bad position for them. So uh, would be nice if they didn't just disappear, but, you know, what can you do? Uh, we get the win here in six moves uh, with uh, with this particular opening. <laughs> so, um not really a whole lot to add on this one, quite honestly. It's a bit of a short game for being the third one in the episode. Uh, against the London system, we go for the typical c5 break. We go for the move e6 to try to regain the pawn. Uh, I can show a few ideas if white tries to hold on to the pawn. So if white tries a move like, let's say, pawn to b4, against this pawn to b4 type of defense, it's usually good for us to make the move pawn to a5 to chip away at the, uh, at the base of the two pawns. If we get rid of the b4 pawn, then the c5 pawn falls next like uh, like a house of cards. White cannot play the move a3 because here we can take the pawn on b4 and they cannot recapture because then the rook would be lost. They could try the move c3, but even in a case like this, we can trade the pawns, we can play a move like b6, and it's pretty hard for white to hold everything together here. Uh, they're most likely going to lose you know, one of these pawns back. If they try something like bishop to d6 here, I think we can take the pawn on c5. Uh, if white recaptures, we even have ideas, I think, knight to e4 or bishop takes d6 first. Something like this is going to be pretty rough for white. It's hard to hold the d6 pawn. Queen a5 check is an idea. Queen f6 attacking the pawn and the rook is an idea. And white's really just in a tough spot here. It's, it's very difficult to hold everything in their position together. Uh, that's also the case, I will say, if white tries to play bishop d6 right away. We can also still trade the bishops. If they take with the queen, uh, knight to e4 uh, might be an idea. 
I think knight to a6 is even an idea. Uh, and there's a couple of different ways we can kind of attack the pawn on c5 another time. Queen to e7, take the pawn on c5. We're going to get the pawn back without really any trouble here in a case like this. So in the game, they didn't defend it, which is fine. Uh, but they do go for this knight to b5 move. This is the move that really gets them in trouble. We check, attack the pin piece. And there's really not a good way to save, uh, like, you know, to work against both of these threats that white has. Uh, the computer engine gives it only a minus two advantage for black. I'm not really sure what the best move is here for white to play, but uh, it's suffice it to say it's a very, very bad position for white only six moves into the game. So that's it for our three games in this episode here for the rating range of 900 to 1000. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed these couple of games. Uh, in the next episode of this series, we'll be playing against players in the rating range of 1,000 to 1,100. Uh, technically, this opponent was a hair over the rating of 1,000, but we'll see more players in that uh, 1,000 to 1,100 rating range in the next, next episode. And uh, I hope you will enjoy the next one, and I hope you enjoyed this one.